Hey everybody, welcome back to 13 Motorsports. My name is Sky, and you're watching the Learn to Weld video series, part two. All right, you guys, so in the last video, as you know, we've covered the differences between the MIG and the TIG machine, what sets them apart, and we also covered some of the safety equipment that you're going to use while you're welding. This time around, you guessed it, we're gonna jump into the actual welding portion, and I'm gonna share with you a few different basic techniques and also some tips and tricks that I have learned over my years of welding. Another quick tip for you, don't weld when you're hungry, okay? Especially when you're TIG welding because your hands will start to shake and then your weld starts getting all crazy. So make sure you've eaten properly before you start welding. Okay, so another important factor when you're welding is making sure that your metal is perfectly clean or as clean as it can possibly be. Um, because if the metal's dirty in any way, that'll immediately contaminate your weld and it will be worthless. So I'm gonna do some practice welding here to show you a few things. And I wanna show you a piece of cold rolled steel. So basically this has what's called mill scale on it and that'll affect your weld. You wanna clean that off, do it with a flat disc or wire wheel or whatever you can to get that off of there. Get down to the bare steel underneath. That's really nice and clean and this will weld well whereas this will spit and pop and do all sorts of nasty stuff. So again, whether it's dirt, rust, or whatever, make sure your metal is as clean as it can possibly get before you start welding. All right, you guys, so what we're gonna do first is we're gonna start off with a MIG weld. And this is on material that's pretty much the maximum thickness that I can do with this welder. This is a 3 16th inch thick steel plate. So basically we're gonna run a little bead on this. And what I've done is the workpiece itself is grounded. You want to hook up your ground. Uh, in this case, I hooked it directly to the vise that it's attached in. So we're grounded there. And then turn on your machine. Make sure your gas is on as well. And then as far as the torch itself goes, so keep a pair of dikes handy because you'll want to cut the length of the wire itself down just a little bit. I don't like it to stick out quite that far when I start. I'll cut it down just a little bit, just like that. So that's about where I'd like to do it at. So when you start the weld, when you pull the trigger and you get the puddle started, I happen to, I like to push. I like to push my welds. I don't really pull them so much. Um, and also what I like to do with MIG specifically is I'll do what's called the C method. So I'll move, I'll exaggerate the motion, but I'll, I'll move it in circles like this. Little half moon circles back and forth as you go along. Just like that, and that should build the weld up, and you'll get kind of a nice little crescent-shaped, kind of a rolling coin type of effect from that. So I'm gonna turn the machine on, and let's give it a shot. All right, so you can kind of see the effect there. It does give you something of a rolled corn effect. And there you go. So I think that's a pretty decent weld. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Of course, it's not as great as some people can do. There's some people who are just phenomenal welders. But again, I know that that weld is strong. I know it is capable and it's aesthetically pleasing enough for me. Now, one of the big things about welding that you'll eventually learn is it's all about pace and tempo. Pace and tempo, okay? So when you're rolling back and forth and you're moving along, you start to get a feel for how fast you need to go based on the, how the weld is going itself, all right? All right, we're gonna try this again with the welding hood, so hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing this time around.
Okay, so full disclosure, this was a T-style joint, which is really one of the easiest welds there is to do. But that's okay because welding is all about confidence. So start with welds like this. Start with a T-joint weld and go ahead and just watch the puddle, see how it develops, see how the metal reacts to what you're doing, and you'll improve, you'll make advancement. And that's really the point and the courage I'm trying to give you guys. All right, so next up, I just did the MIG weld on the T-joint here. We're gonna switch over to a TIG, and I'm gonna to try to show you that as well, what the differences are between them, and I'm gonna show the welds side by side so you can really appreciate the difference. Just a quick safety tip while you're in the shop using the filler rod. It's very sharp on the ends. It can be rather pointy. You don't wanna go poking yourself in the eyeball, or more importantly, you don't wanna go poking anyone else in the eyeball because when you got your hood down, it's kind of flinging all over the place. So just a good tip for this is go ahead and take the end of the filler rod, put a nice bend in it like that. That way you can kind of protect everyone else. You don't have to worry about getting poked in the eye with it. Okay guys, so a really important factor when you're doing your TIG welding is the tungsten rod. Now that's the little metal rod there that's inside the, the torch. And when you're welding mild steel or stainless steel, it is extremely important to keep the tip of that rod very sharp. Now that's important because that's what helps to focus the arc. And if it becomes dulled, or rounded in any way, you'll actually see it when you're welding. The arc will start to distort and it'll widen out a bunch. Now what's that doing? Well, it's heating a wider portion of the metal at one time and so it's not able to focus that heat as well. So the weld puddle becomes distorted, it becomes all spread out and it's not very clean. It's not a good way to get a nice clean looking weld. Now, Another negative side effect of that is that it puts more heat into the workpiece as a whole. You don't want to do that. All you want to do is just pinpoint that heat exactly in the spot where you're trying to weld. Now give you the neatest, cleanest weld. Now, how do you go about sharpening the tungsten? Well, you know what? That's a topic for another day. Seems as though there's several different methods and the debate rages on. I'm not going to tell you how I do it because invariably hundreds of people will tell me, well, that's not the way, that's not the right way to do it and you'll never get a good weld that way. Well, yes, I can get a good weld the way I'm doing it. It works just fine for me. You'll just have to do some research for yourselves on sharpening a tungsten and the best way to do it and then try it yourselves. Just practice and see what works for you. So on that same topic of tungsten sharpening, it's different if you're welding aluminum. What you want is instead of a sharp point like I have here, you actually want a ball on the end. And you can actually help self form that if you actually just take your tungsten and strike the arc a few different times. Don't actually try to initiate any welding, just hold the foot pedal down a little bit and strike the arc and the heat will actually form the end of the tungsten into a ball shape. So that's good for aluminum. All right, you guys, so here's a direct comparison of MIG versus TIG. So MIG, I probably could have done a slightly neater job there, but you know, you can see there's some splatter and such. And then you come over to TIG. Now, again, this is 1 16th filler rod. I wouldn't really recommend that for how thick of metal this is as filler. You want a little bit more than that to adhere it together. But you can really get a super nice finish on there if you take it slow and just have a good rhythm and pace. Um, I'll do another weld here on the end and I'll do this one with 3 30 seconds rod so you can kind of see a more accurate sized filler. Okay, let's give this another shot with the hood and see if you guys can see what I'm doing. Okay, so not quite as pretty as the other one because, I don't know, the camera is kind of in the way, so I was having a difficult time getting a good rhythm there. But still, you can see how clean it is. I mean, look at that. There's just, there's no slag popping off of there. Super clean. You don't really even need to wire brush it. I mean, sometimes I like to leave it just for the colors. I mean, that's just pretty. So that is a huge advantage of TIG is for aesthetic reasons alone.
Okay, just another tip I wanted to give about torch angle and, and MIG gun angle. So you don't really want to go dead on and then you don't want to be too flat or too vertical. Um, on a T-joint like this, I'll generally do kind of a 45-ish degree angle and I'll lay the MIG gun back just a little bit so it helps you can see what you're doing and you can really help to push the weld forward a little bit. Also, it's the same kind of story with the actual TIG torch itself. You want to be kind of laid back just a little bit, 45 degree angle, and distance away from the workpiece is something that you'll gain with time. Um, you don't want to be too close because at that point it's too easy to accidentally dab the tungsten into the weld itself and contaminate it. So you want to pull back just a little bit so you got enough room in there to where you're still concentrating the weld but you're able to add filler without contamination. If at any time while you're welding your tungsten becomes contaminated, immediately stop welding, okay? Don't continue. How do you know it's contaminated? Well, many times you'll know it just because you've done it. You've, you've accidentally touched it with the filler rod as you're trying to dip it in there, or you dip the tungsten too low and actually dipped into the weld pool. That's going to happen a lot while you're learning because it's hard to really establish a rhythm and get used to exactly how to hold the torch. So that will happen quite a bit. And another good indicator that you have contaminated the tungsten the color of the arc will change hue slightly while you're welding. It'll go to like a paler green or almost even a bluish color. And that's the way you know that this is contaminated. It won't start out that nice green color anymore. And it'll start to flicker. Your arc will start to jump around and it won't be quite square where it was anymore. So again, Im immediately stop welding, remove the tungsten, resharpen it, clean it as best you can, get any foreign contaminants off of it, and then go back to welding. Okay, so another huge advantage of TIG welding is that you can switch over to stainless welding with relative ease because again, all you're doing is you're just swapping out your actual filler rod that you have in your hand. So you get some stainless rod, you get some stainless tube. I'm gonna run a quick bead on here and show you why I love working with this so much. Okay, so you can kind of see there, just a pop, 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 get a nice rhythm, get a nice pattern, and you just run a bead on there. Um, I'm using 1 16th rod there. One thing I just love about stainless is that the, the metal is more consistent than mild steel. You don't run into so many areas where the weld puddle will pool out all of a sudden or have impurities in it. Uh, it's very stable all the way through so it's easy to run a bead on it and make it look consistent. Um, I also like the colors that come out when you're doing stainless. I actually got just a little bit too hot here, so you're not quite seeing all the rainbow colors there. That's how you know you're in the sweet spot with stainless. You get those rainbow colors. If the weld is a very flat gray looking color, then you've gone way too hot. I'll show you that now. Okay, so I ran another bead there and I kind of went overkill on it, but I just really want to show you what I was talking about. So you can see with how hot I got it, the weld pool flattened out big time. It's really wide and also it is a flat uniform gray. There is no color there at all. So I completely overheated that weld versus this one where it stays fairly tight and you got some rainbow colors. Okay, something to really think about when you're TIG welding is a technique that I particularly like to use is I don't like to just go full bore right into my weld. Um, generally what I like to do is your amperage knob on the machine, that's basically setting your maximum amperage, okay? And you have your foot pedal here to help control that amperage. Now there's a couple of good techniques for this, but what I like to do to start is I will depress the pedal just lightly and then get my arc started. And then as soon as I see my arc start and I know I'm in the right spot, then I will add in enough amperage to really get the weld pool going. And you don't have to just floor it right away and go for it. So click it down just a little bit, start the arc, and then roll it forward until you know you're at the correct amperage you need. So another area in which the foot pedal really comes in handy so you can vary your amperage is you gotta think about with metal that it's cold to start with, 
So you have to take a good amount of amperage to actually get the weld tool started in the first place. But as you continue on with your weld, the whole piece of metal is going to heat up. As it does so, it's going to take less amperage to accomplish the same thing. So as you go, you can, you can watch it with the weld pool with, un, with your hood. As you go, you're going to want to start to back off the pedal just a little bit until you find a nice middle ground where the part is now hot, but you can continue on using a nice even weld pool. Now this is especially critical with aluminum, okay, because aluminum dissipates heat extremely well. So you have to pour heat into it to start, to actually get that weld pool going. And then after you get that weld pool going, it starts to heat up really fast. So then you have to back way off of the pedal to keep a nice even weld. So aluminum, that's kind of why people refer to it as being trickier to weld because you really have to have finesse when you're using that foot pedal, you're using that amperage. You really want to modify and control it as best you can. All right, you guys, I'm going to talk for a second about uh, putting heat into metal and what it does. So when you're dealing with 3 16th inch plate like this, it's pretty thick metal and it will act as something of a heat sink. So it distributes the heat pretty quickly, but the, the metal will heat up with enough time. So the natural inclination when you're welding something is to just weld it up, just get it done, burn it on in and it'll be done. Well, I promise you, if you do that, you're going to have all sorts of frustration. Okay. You really need to take your time and really what's called stitch weld. Just do a short bit gap, short bit, gap, short bit. And then you go back and fill in the gaps after it's cooled down. Let it cool between each of those welds and you can really minimize your chances of warping. That's especially true if you're working with something like this. This is 16 gauge sheet metal, which is actually really thick for sheet metal. But even so, if you just run a bead all the way down this thing, it's, it's going to look like a pretzel when you're done and you'll have wasted all of your efforts to that point. So especially when you're dealing with sheet metal, like down to 20 gauge and stuff like that, really just tack, maybe run a short bead, gap it by quite a bit, tack, short bead, tack, short bead. And then after it's cooled through that initial pass, you go back, you build a little bit more, well, a little bit more. Patience is your friend. If you get impatient and just try to run too big of a bead, man, again, it's just going to pretzel this thing and you'll have wasted all your effort. So patience is indeed a virtue. All right. So I just gave you that speech about going slow, not running too much of a bead at once. That way the metal doesn't warp. Well, sometimes it happens anyway. Uh, it's just, it's too easy to get the metal hot in some instances and the metal will move. But again, it's metal. You can still shape it. You can still form it. So go slow in that take a lot of measurements beforehand. So you know if it's starting to twist out of place or something like that. If you find that it is, you should still be able to massage it back into place before you actually finish weld everything out. All right, you guys, so I'm sure you can tell from both of those videos with the MIG and with the TIG that a big part of welding is pace and rhythm. Pace, especially with the MIG welding, but rhythm too with TIG welding, that's just something that comes with time. That's all it is. You just gotta get the seat time, really put the effort in, and then you'll start to see progress and improvement. A good indicator if you're in the correct heat range for your weld is to actually look at the weld itself. Is it rounded outward? convex, then you're likely a little bit too cold. If it's too rounded, you want it to be almost nice and flat, especially if you're doing like a T-joint or something, you want it to be a little flat. It can even be undercut, concave just a little bit. But if you're undercut too far, then you're either using not enough filler rod or you are a little bit too hot. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. All right, you guys, so one of the most important tips about welding that I really want to impart to you is that a big part of it is about being comfortable. Now, there's a lot of situations where you're going to be in an uncomfortable position trying to weld something that does happen. But overall, in most situations, really try to be as comfortable as you can, especially if you're working like a smaller piece that you can actually set in a vise or something like that. Make sure you're as comfortable as you can be when you get the piece set up. And also, make sure you brace yourself. Whatever hand you're using, I'm a lefty, so I'm holding this in the left, but whatever hand you're using to actually weld with, Make sure it's braced against something so it can be as smooth and as stable as possible. All right. When you try to freehand stuff, your hands are going to move 
and that will lead to a very erratic looking weld. Okay, brace your hand if at all possible, that way you can really get a nice smooth movement, very controlled. Another good tip I have for you regarding what people talk about, whether the welds are strong or not, practice on some scrap metal and then cut that metal vertically straight through the weld that you just did and see if you can discern a line between the original metal and the weld that you just put on there. If you can, that means the weld has not penetrated properly and that weld is too cold and it's not a strong weld. If you cut that in half and turn it sideways and you can't determine any sort of difference between the weld that you just put on there and the original metal, congratulations, you've done an effective weld. Okay, look, if there's one thing I hate worse than anything else and I hear all the time, it's, well, it's not pretty, but it's strong. And I absolutely hate that saying. And you know what? I know I've even said that in the past. But it's horrible. You see these people and they weld stuff and it just, it looks absolutely atrocious and that's their excuse. Well, it's not pretty, but it's strong. Two things wrong with that statement. One, how do you know it's strong? Usually when you're welding on top of other bad welds, it's full of porosity and it's really not strong at all. There's a lot of material globbed on there, but that doesn't mean it's actually holding on to anything. And two, that means that's you accepting that you're crappy at welding. And that's not okay. Expect more from yourself. You see these guys and they weld something and it's got this boogered up weld on there and then they take a grinder to it and just grind the heck out of it until it's totally flat again and there's practically no weld holding anything. And it looks kind of okay because they did use a flap disc on it so it looks kind of smooth. They're like, I guess it works out okay. Don't accept that. Don't think that that's the standard for yourself. If you know something wasn't done right, cut it apart do it again. Just keep practicing. You will improve. And it honestly doesn't take as much time as you think it does. And when you do improve and you start getting those results that you want, that's when you can weld something and you don't have to preface it with, well, it's ugly, but it's strong. Don't be afraid to make mistakes, whether you're TIG welding or MIG welding. Have a plenty of metal scrap on hand that you can use to just try as many different things as you can, as many different techniques as you can try. It's all about seat time. Really put in the time, try it, see how it works for you because not everything works for everyone else. I mean, there's several techniques I could talk about, especially with TIG, like walking the cup, that sort of thing. I've tried it. I don't find it to be a very natural motion. Most people don't, it's a learned thing. I'm still working on it. I've been welding for probably eight or nine years now and it's still something that I'm not very good at. So it's a continual process. I'm not where I want to be as far as my welding goes, but I feel like I've come to a certain point where I can at least impart some wisdom to others who are just starting out. All right, so one of the things that I really love about welding is your ability to mix and match, all right? Because before you know how to weld, you're really kind of limited to what's available for your make and model, whether it's a vehicle or motorcycle, whatever. So whatever's available in the stores, that's the only thing you have that you can buy to make it work. Well, as soon as you're able to weld, fabricate, and modify, then it's everything across the board. So you can take parts from here, parts from there. You're like, oh, I love that from that bike, or I want that from that truck. You can do that. That's the point. So my Turbo XS 650 that I've told you about in another video, that bike actually had parts from nine different manufacturers in it. I had uh, injectors and a throttle body from a Dodge Neon. I had a blow-off valve from a Mitsubishi Eclipse. I had a turbo from an Audi TT. I had uh, parts from Ducati, Buell, Suzuki, Yamaha, the whole deal. I mean, it, and it doesn't matter because they're all just parts and they all serve a purpose. So if they work in your build, you can adapt them. And really that's the beauty behind becoming a fabricator and being able to make these things work for you. Another quick piece of advice for you. The gas is not cheap for either of these. Make sure you turn your bottle off when you're done welding. You only have to leave it open once and then come out a few days later and find out your bottle is empty before you'll never do that again. In fact, several times in the dead of night, I hop out of my bed and run down to the garage thinking, oh my God, I left my bottles open. I'm not going to have any gas. When actually, I did shut them. But that's kind of the mentality that gets into your head. As soon as you leave that open one time and you run yourself out of gas, you'll never do it again. But it's a lesson you don't need to learn. Make sure after every welding session, you turn off your bottles. That way you don't have to worry about it. 
All right, you guys, so that's all I can think of right now as far as tips and tricks for welding on both TIG and MIG. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, any of that, by all means, put something down in the comments. I'll answer it if I can. Again, I'm not a professional, but these are some tricks that I've learned throughout my years of welding. Don't be scared of it. Jump in and just, I really appreciate you watching this sort of thing. It really helps me to improve and move forward. And remember, there's always more room in this world for people who are willing to build things themselves. We'll see you next time on 13 Motorsports.